All right, so welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you our uh, today's speaker, Betsy Salvo. Betsy is uh, an assistant professor at Georgia Tech in um, are you in the College of Computing? Yes, yeah, I'm in the College of Computing. Yes. Associate. Good, I thought so. Your C V <laughs> says assistant's been a long time. I was gonna say that can't be because because she's the author of dozens of publications, um, millions and millions and millions in grants, um, PI and, and co PI, is um, very well known in areas around educational technology, technology design, um, social computing, um, uh, has done work with, um, uh, I guess the word used was uh, black youth in technology. Um, a lot of the work, work now around um, computation for all, programming for all, um, CS for all, sorry, um, and teaching programming, she's well known in that. So really a, um, a very well known researcher and highly regarded researcher. Um, one of my colleagues I was chatting with that she was visiting and said she's also brilliant and wickedly funny to work with as a co-PI, so <laughs> comes very highly recommended. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to have you uh, speaking with us today, so Betsy, take it off. Thank you. That was super nice. Um, so my current work is being done in the Culture and Technology Lab. And it covers a broad range of topics. And I have um, seven current and a recent graduate PhD student that I'm working with. And they all are really passionate about these different things. Um, but there is something that kind of unites them all. And this is idea about designing technology interactions with a focus on cultural practices and implications. So I'm going to talk specifically just about a few projects. But to help situate this, I'm going to actually um, go back to some of my history and how I started working in the field of academia and interested in questions around this. So around 2005, so I'm going way back, um, I was a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh and there was a number of researchers at that time looking at women in games and the idea was if we could get young women interested in gaming the way that their male peers were that they would become interested in computing and technology fields. Um, so I was working on this game with Kevin Crowley at Pitt and Kristen Hughes at CMU called Click, um, and the goal was to spark middle school girls' interest in STEM. And then over the course of three years, I'd worked with like over 200 young women try in the design of this game. And about half of these young women were African American, so I just got kind of curious, like what does the research say? I've been reading a lot about women in gaming, but what does the research say about race and ethnicity in gaming? And what I really found was there was almost no research on race and ethnicity in gaming at that time. And what little research there was out there was quantitative, which told us that young African American males and Latinos were gaming more hours per week than their white and Asian peers. Um, so I decided to understand why African American males were not leveraging their gameplay into an interest in computing um, to study how they were playing games and then study how computer scientists were playing games. And I was looking at African American males because at that point I moved to Atlanta and um, large population, actually majority population African American. Um, so I conducted several studies with young African American males and also with computer science students who told us that games sparked their interest in computing. Um, I found that there were significant differences in their play practices and these seem to be tied to um, differing interest in computing at the end of the day. So while CS majors told us that they were really interested in hacking, modding, um, joining guilds, writing strategy guides, things like that, um, things that would break open the game and like it, let them look at the computation underneath, African American males were very much telling us that they were playing a lot of sports games um, and along with playing sports games, they played them like sports. So there was no cheating, no hacking, no modding. Um, it was very much bringing their cultural value of sportsmanship into their play, uh, gameplay practices. Um, so because of this, uh, it seemed to be if we could get young African American males interested in breaking open the console, looking into that black box, we might be able to leverage their interest in games into an interest in computing. So I went through lots and lots of ideals. Um, and really, at the end of the day, <coughs> came up with one project. And this ran for about three years. It was called the Glitch Game Testers. This was a legitimate reason for these young men to break open the games, because they were hired as game testers uh, full-time in the summer, part-time during the school year, 
to actually test games for real companies. Um, and in addition to that, we spent about 30 minutes to an hour of each full work day doing computer science workshops or, or, or lessons. Um, Glitch was extremely successful by most measures um, in motivating these young men to pursue an interest in computing. Um, over 80% of them went on to pursue post-secondary school, and 65% of them went on to pursue school in IT or computing. So this particular in, uh, demographic of young, low-income African-American males, this was extremely successful results. So I first thought that their interest in gaming was a hook, but the persistence that we saw amongst these young men ran a lot deeper than that. Um, it wasn't just their interest in games, it was the respect that they felt when their parents were giving them because they were working full time in the summer, particularly at a job where they didn't have to use some, wear a really lame uniform or something. Um, they were having real game developers listen to their opinion on the games and what they found out about the games. They were contributing to a real item that existed in the world, even though they typically didn't like or play the games they were testing at all. Um, and then they were always telling their friends that they were paid to play. And that was probably about the coolest game you could have as a teenager, or a teenage boy particularly, maybe. Um, even though inside of the Glitch program, they admitted readily that game testing sucked. It's a bad job. It's really boring, right? Um, but what they valued about this, this experience wasn't necessarily that they were interested in games, but all these <coughs> other instances where the face for the persona they could put out there um, made other people value them, right? And that's how they were reading into this and what engaged them so deeply. So we learned a bunch of things from Glitch because it ran for quite some time, but there's just a couple that I'm going to tell you about that have led to the other research that we're doing particularly. Um, so first of all, the Glitch guys were really proud of the work that they were doing and the fact that they were working full time. Um, but none of them actually told their parents that they were studying computer science. All of their parents just thought this was a job. And it was, I asked them all, I found out a few of them were doing this and then I asked every single one of them. Um, so we became suddenly very interested as to why that was and some of it is that their parents wouldn't really respect them for just going out and doing an educational program the same way that they would respect them for having a job. So it made me really start thinking about, well, what is it, how are these parents, you know, brokering or providing learning opportunities for their kids if that's what their kids are interpreting from them? Now, I actually don't think their parents would disrespect them if they were participating in a learning opportunity, but that was their perception, right? Um, the other thing about Glitch was that it was very specific to this demographic. It was young, uh, high school age, African American males in Atlanta who had an interest in gaming, typically from lower income families. So this wasn't something that we could say, oh, you can take this same value-based approach that we found for Glitch and apply it anywhere, right? We needed to start thinking about working with more heterogeneous communities like a typical classroom, right? Where not everybody is the same. So these were the two sort of issues and problems we started working on. So thinking about parents and why these guys were withholding information from their parents about learning and how their parents were engaging in them with learning, we sparked a whole line of research, including national surveys, interviews with parents across broad demographic areas, some emphasis with low African American, low income African American parents because that's the community I've been working in for years. Um, and then we also did some design research projects, probes, and participatory design activities. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about any of those today, but I just want to give you some quick takeaways that we found from these research projects. Um, so lower income families particularly perceived that they had lower technical skills than other groups. And this was particularly true for women. So um, moms from lower income neighborhoods were really afraid to actually use technology for their kids' learning. They were afraid to access new things. One of the things that they told us was that they only allowed their kids to go into a few sites because if they visited any site they wanted to, it was likely they were gonna download malware, right? So it really changed their access to information. Um, we also found that, unsurprisingly, higher 
um, income individuals had more heterogeneous networks, social networks that provided a greater range of information, a greater diversity of information. And that seems to be amplified online even more so. So lower income families were not really seeking information online and when they were it was within this small group um, that was just echoing the same things that they already knew, right? And finally the last thing is um, we found, and this again is not a shocker, but all parents are afraid of being judged at how good they are at parenting or how bad they are at parenting. But this was more concerning for lower income parents. So while we would see higher income parents being willing to ask for help online, we found that lower income parents were less likely to ask for help online because they were afraid that other people would judge them if they had needed help in parenting. Right? So this was another thing that was limiting their access and ability to get information about educational resources for their children. We did a, another study that was kind of looking at this from the other direction, which was looking at um, parents' use of search engines for information about educational resources. And this was specifically looking at educational resources for computing. A, a lot of my work is around computer science education. Um, so we ask, uh, did a survey of parents asking them what are the terms that you would use if your child said they were interested in computing. And most of the terms that they use were things that are not really surprising. Computer, kids, teaching, learning, coding, and then maybe the age or grade of the kids. So we use those specific terms as well as um, general terms to look up and see if we found any of these educational resources, which are the free online educational resources that one could use to teach your child about programming. And what we found, we had 59 unique search queries, so that's like in the first two pages we looked at, that's about 2,000 results, right? We found that six out of that 2,000 were actually direct links to code.org, um, which is supposed to have this massive national appeal to uh, introduce people into computing, young people. And then Scratch, um, programming environment uh, had one search term came up with links, but that search term was obviously sent in by somebody who knows about Scratch, so they used Scratch in that search term. And there was four links that came up for Scratch within this. And you might ask why this is happening or um, that if I was just a typical parent looking for educational resources for my kid about computing, why is it that they can't access these things? So we actually looked at the sites um, and we looked at them in terms of, through a lens of search engine optimization and we found that the sites really didn't use any sort of search engine optimization. So while with the best of intentions to equalize education, they were actually facilitating more of this case where education was accessible to the wealthy and well-educated who knew the right search terms to use <coughs> and less accessible to those from lower <coughs> incomes. So with all these things in mind, we have focused a little bit more now on a sp specific demographic, which is um, recent Latino immigrants to the United States. Well, not necessarily recent, but Latino immigrants to the United States. And we know that they face a lot of barriers in supporting their children's education beyond just language, but also cultural, um, cultural misunderstandings. They tend to support their kids doing homework at home. So they make a special place for them in their home, they may buy them a computer, and they give them lots of encouragement, ask them lots of questions about their homework at home. But they don't do a lot of stuff to engage their kids with other opportunities in learning outside of school. Um, and finally, all of these things combine to mean that there is a very persistent academic gap between Latino and American students. And actually some of the lower performance that we're finding in the schools are coming from our Spanish-speaking populations. So one of my students, Marisol Delacruz Wong, is now studying this, and she spent over two years now doing interviews and observations in schools, after-school programs, religious organization, NGOs, and um, uh, English as Second Language uh, departments, and talking to school bilingual school liaisons. So hundreds and hundreds of hours of volunteering and talking and becoming engaged with one particular county um, school district. There's a paper that has been accepted for CHI and will come out this spring at CHI 
that, um, ta that she's taken all this work together to really describe the parenting network of Latino parents. And there's lots of different actors in this network, but I'm gonna just talk about two of them specifically, mothers and then the school-related technology. So we identified three type of mother actors in this network. Um, the resourceful mothers demonstrate a pattern of engaging a wide variety of actors within and outside of the school to build strong information channels that allow her to gather resources helping her children. So Rita, this quote is from, is a 37-year-old with three school-going children and often enacts the role of a resourceful mother. Um, she immigrated from Mexico 15 years ago and had very little education in Mexico or in the United States, formal education. However, she's still been able to learn a lot of effective ways to help her children um, engaging and improving their education as well as her own. As Rita says, initially my kids' homework were in Chico, foreign language to me, but using translators and dictionaries, I started using homework as a way to you, I'm sorry, I started using homework as a way to learn new words. I also realized that watching TV and YouTube videos with my children helped me learn new experiences. Another thing that helped me was losing the fear to talk to Americans. Because when you talk to them, they usually do not make fun of you, but correct you and teach you new things. <coughs> so I think this highlights a couple things. One is how a resourceful mother, actor in this network might act, but also kind of where the fear um, comes from for some of the other mothers. Um, for example, we have the trusting mother. So Elena is a 35-year-old mother with four children. Um, and like Rita, she arrived from Mexico about 15 years ago with limited schooling background. Um, for her, mobilizing the resources for being at school is really difficult because she doesn't have transportation and she also has young children at home. Um, plus she doesn't speak English and she really doesn't wanna engage with the teachers unless they're Spanish speaking as well. So given her current inability to be at school and develop a real close relationship with the teachers, she's chosen to trust the teachers and to trust that they're aligning their interests with her own interests for their kids. Um, and we find that this becomes more amplified as technology is pushing more and more information out to the parents. They feel less need to engage with the teachers. So as Elena says, teachers are always keeping me updated about what happens with the two little ones. And they keep sending me messages with information about what the kids have to do, about projects they need to work on, and even photos of what they're doing in the classroom. But some mothers encounter these new situations and they don't know how to handle them. Um, they might become extremely insecure about how to make sense of the information that they're surrounded with. And that was the case with 28-year-old Monica. She was actually a recent immigrant to the United States from Mexico with her two boys and her husband. And although she had far more education than either Elena or Rita did, formal education in Mexico. Um, the emotion of these cultural burden barriers was just getting to be too much for her. And she was sort of giving up on interacting with the schools altogether. Um, Monica told us this story about her six-year-old um, who's struggling with everything here. It's reached the point where he just doesn't want to come to school anymore. Teachers say that he was very behind with school when he came in. I feel they're just being unfair to him because they keep saying he arrived knowing nothing as if he had not attended school before, but that's not true. He went to school in Mexico for two years before we came. I've talked to everybody here, including Paula, who is her bilingual school liaison, to see how they can help me, yet nothing changes. I think they do not care about helping Antonio. So one can see this kind of situation could be a pattern that happens for a lot of mothers um, and parents who are engaged with the school system. Another part of the network that we studied was technology, um, specifically classroom related media. So there's much written about everyday technology with Latino um, populations in the United States, but very little that's been published about um, what is happening within how information exchange is happening with the schools. So teachers are using a lot of classroom related media, similar to this, um, the Class Dojo app, um, to send information out to parents about their kids' behavior or other apps to send information about their kids' performance in school. Um, and so 
some of what's happening is all this information is one directional, being sent from the teachers out to the parents. Another thing that's happening is that the parents are then misinterpreting this information and have nowhere to go for guidance. So <coughs> Carmen tells us, um, I noticed the teacher was taking points away from his notebook, so I pushed him, so I punished him taking away toys and video games. We later found out by talking to the teacher that actually um, Carmen's son wasn't doing anything wrong in class. Points were being taken away from the whole class. He wasn't really misbehaving at all. Yet he was getting punished at home. And this is the kind of miscommunication that builds up mistrust between the students and the school more generally, right? Another thing that teachers are doing quite a bit is trying to push uh, the idea that parents need technology in their home, including desktops. And one would think this would help for the parent-teacher communication, but what's happening is that parents are bringing these technologies into the home and then never using them again. So as Andrea says, I only got, I honestly only got it, the desktop computer, so that kids could do their homework. The guy who set it up told me I could do lots of things with it, but since I don't ever use it, I have no idea what's in there. This is simply bringing a piece of technology in their home. It sits there, kids have full autonomy and access to it, but parents aren't able to leverage it for these communication needs. So there's another kind of technology that is um, being used by the schools in, this is institutional related media. So this is about the school calendars, newsletters, websites, Facebook pages, and while they're translated, almost nobody uses these things. And we found this true for Latino parents, but we also found it true for almost all parents. Um, as Chabela says, who's a bilingual school liaison, it's just too much information, often mixed with information in English for her particular clients as well, because these are sites are all bilingual. The parents don't read it. I've asked around. Most parents don't even know we have a website. So all this information that's being pushed out for the school allows the school to kind of check a box off that they've communicated with the parents, and instead it's just sitting there unread. Um, so at this point, we've done all these studies. We're starting to enter into the design phase and look at what we could design for these particular audiences. And some of the challenges we see is that there are these institutional kind of technologies that are used versus the everyday technologies that we know Latino parents are using, like WhatsApp and reminder systems. Um, we saw that the, the, te the liaisons in the school were using those sometimes against the wishes of the school, so they were having to use them on the sly. Um, to communicate with parents, but the schools themselves weren't using them at all. So they're getting all sorts of information through channels that they just aren't comfortable using, and schools feel they need to use these channels because they have to check off the box that they sent the information off, but also because they have privacy concerns about what public information gets out there. So they're really different kind of goals. Um, we also found, obviously, that there's this abundant amount of information being sent which isn't very meaningful for these parents. Um, so somehow aligning parents' interest in what is meaningful with what the school sends out would be most useful in a new design. And then finally, it's this detached versus personal interaction, and some of this is actually cultural, where these parents really wanted a more personal interaction around their child. This is one of the most important things in their lives is their child, right? So if somebody is just sending out mass emails, that, doesn't, that seems way too detached. They want to have a more personal connection to think about their child's future. So we've decided to look to design for the idea of engagement in mind rather than just imposing. So we are looking at two directional kind of communication tools and possibly tools where we can have parents build communities themselves and talk amongst each other. Um, that would help as well with making this more personalized information rather than detached information. And we'd also like to generate meaning at scale. And so one of the things that we're looking at and exploring first, beginning to do some design activities around this, is trying to build some intelligent agents which can learn from the school liaisons, possibly from other parent groups, and from the communications that are happening within these groups, and communicate back out um, personalized meaning to the parents as they need it, rather than all the information at once. Um, there's some unique challenges with that, and there may be cultural pushback to that. So 
really in the early design stages. So that talks a little bit about what we've done looking at the parent's role and learning opportunities. And now I want to kind of tackle this other question that came up from Glitch, which was creating learning experiences that leverage cultural values, but for a wide variety of students, right? So one of the ways that we're trying to address this is with <coughs> responsive design. Um, and we think of this as a way to build designs which actually can be adapted to the identity of the kids <coughs> who are interacting with it. So this project, um, Kurt's actually on the advisory board for this project, but this project is the Playful Formative Assessment Project. Um, it's recently launched from NSF funded research. Um, we're partnering with Teachers College, Wisconsin, Filament Games, SRI Education, and Digital Promise. Um, so this is part of the CS for All initiative out of New York, where there has been a multi-million dollar effort underway to integrate computer science um, into all sorts of disciplines within the K through 12 curriculum. So many science, math, art, and even physical education teachers right now are being asked to integrate <coughs> concepts like computational data and visualization and storage into their classrooms. So one of, and we did about six months of formative work to kind of understand the problem space. And one of the things that we identified was that um, while these teachers could implement the lesson plans with help from the technology specialist in their schools, they could not assess whether the learning was happening or not. And so particularly they couldn't assess in a formative manner so they could make changes if learning wasn't happening because they simply didn't have the background in computing. So we built a formative assessment game um, and it is specifically focused on assessing data and analysis because this is the particular topic area from the K through 12 computer science framework that we found most schools were trying to integrate in the most diverse classes. Um, and so we thought it was kind of the most challenging area for assessment. So we built the idea of this game around music um, because music is important to teenagers. It's not important to them just because they're interested in it or they like music. It's very important to them because it's part of their identity. Many of the subcultures that one could find within any middle school or high school is about saying, oh, I'm into rap or I'm into hip hop. And those are things that are actually very much tied to identity as well as being tied to just enjoying the music itself. So this is a music production studio where um, the students sign up artists from a variety of different um, genres and then look at marketing data upon, about these artists and how well they're doing to make their next judgment of who to sign, which record, records to, um, which recordings to make and where to launch them within the fictional boroughs that we have. Um, so, what we found, we've only done two play testing sessions on this so far, but one of the more interesting findings for this is when the students initially start playing this game, we're seeing signs of their identity. They're signing up only rap artists because that's the <laughs> only music that they like, right? Which is totally fine. We were hoping that would happen. Or, you know, as we asked one of the students, how did you decide which artist you wanted to sign? Because they go by their name. Because they had a cool name. A lot of the names are very similar to actual artists that are out there. We're probably going to get sued over that. I keep telling them that, but whatever. Um, but after they play the game for a while, like 10 or 20 minutes, we see that they're making different kinds of decisions or decisions based on different information. They're looking at different data visualizations about what's popular and what's not popular in different parts of the city. And they're using that to help create songs. So as I said, the marketing area is where all the data is accessed and you can buy more data if you want to. Um, bar charts are by far everybody's favorite, but we have other data visualizations as well. And we also have heat maps, but I don't have a, a picture of that. And then as you buy data, you can increase how much data that you buy for what period of time. And you use up both your money and the storage in buying data. So we're trying to assess how much they understand storage, how much they understand data visualization, how much they can predict based off of data, which are all part of the K through 12 framework. Um, I have no data to tell you about how <laughs> successful this is, because we've only had two play tests so far. 
Um, but I want to tell you about another approach that we're taking to this more um, kind of reactive design process so that stuff can be made that so that students can make lessons that really appeal to their own individual identity and value system. So we have a set of projects that we're using a meta design approach to, um, which means basically um, in this set of projects, we're actually using maker type activities, microcontrollers, 3D printers, etc., for students to learn things like introductory programming, electronics, um, and prototyping and design skills. And we've actually done these projects across a wide range of classrooms. Um, the goal is for students to pick something out that is important values that they have and to build projects around that. But you need to scaffold that design process for the students because most of these students we're working with are not trained as designers. And unlike a lot of project-based work that says make something cool with these things, we're trying to scaffold that process for them to learn it. So some of the things that we've done have been about identifying some sort of issue in the world and building tools for a superhero or supervillain to address that problem. And my very favorite one is Selfie, who's fighting for gender equality, and this is the shatterer. When you hold the shatterer up, you hear glass breaking above your head. It's just, I had to tell you about it. It's awesome. It's not really important to the talk about. <laughs> Another project we've done is we worked with some um, local art and nonprofit companies to do a project called the Move Lab, which had professional dancers, students from Georgia Tech, and middle school girls create a technology-infused dance and then perform that for the public. Um, this was actually one of the more interesting things about this project was we saw that the kids were really able to leverage their values in terms of designing this dance. So they made dances about things like um, environmental issues, or bullying, things that they encountered in their everyday life, and we scaffold that process for them. One of the other things that we found really fascinating about this was the dancers learned so much technology and the technology learned so much dance, which wasn't one of our goals, but was a nice outcome from this as well. But I'm gonna give a more detailed description of what this meta design process is around the Day of the Dead interactive puppets, and this is the one that we've probably launched the most, and we see a wide variety of outcomes from this process. So this very much leverages this meta design approach that uh, Pellian outlines in his paper. Um, what's that paper called? Participation in Design Things. Um, and there's four stages that he outlines, or four aspects that he outlines in that framework. First is design patterns. So it was a way for us to show the students through examples, models, and multiple approaches to the problem of making an interactive puppet. So we introduced them to um, artwork that was, you know, technology-infused artwork, <coughs> right, by famous artists and let them explore that a little bit. We also introduced them to the cultural practices around the Day of the Dead within the Mexican culture. Um, and then we went on to the component strategy. And this is really about the students building basically building blocks, little Legos that fit together into a larger pro project later. So we scaffold the building of each one of those little Legos and then we help them put it all together. So the components that they did were based off of a worksheet that we had them fill out about someone who has died in their life. Um, some people pick things like this one's about my grandmother and some people picked their dog, and some people picked a character from a book that they read. So we really left it open-ended as to what they were doing. And then we had them reflect on how they celebrate death in their families. How do they mark that within their families? Um, and we've used this from middle school kids all the way up through graduate students. Um, for our graduate classes that we've done this in, it's fascinating because we have students from all over the world, and we have people talking about practices and rituals around death amongst their peers in a conversation I don't think would have been facilitated in any other way. Um, and it also, then they were able to take each one of these sections, so symbolic representation, something the person you're celebrating did in the world that mattered to you. So what they wrote there then became part of what this typical format you might see for developing interactive systems, where there's a start state, an input, some sort of um, processing and output, and then a final state, right? So they could take basically the text that they have and turn it into these kind of states in a uh, project that they wanted to design. 
And finally, we structured the entire thing around a studio-based pedagogy protocol, which was not very typical for most technology courses. So we had a ton of materials that we provided to them. We let them explore those materials. We also did a lot of critiques um, and pin-up sessions where we talked through their designs and they iterated upon those designs. So overall, with the meta design, what we found is if it was too open-ended, um, the teachers really struggled to link the learning goals. Um, the Move Lab was actually an example of that. We gave them all the technology they could want um, and they picked all sorts of different things. It was really hard for us to harness what those learning goals were because we were so busy just troubleshooting the technology, right? If it's too narrow, the students don't have motivational ties to their values. And we saw this a little bit with the superhero project because some of the students were just like, I don't care about superheroes. I don't want to have anything to do with this. It wasn't really open-ended enough. Um, the meta design process through the Day of the Dead, because while we talked about Day of the Dead to kickstart it, it was really about each individual's own culture and how, what their families and what their background bought to thinking about death, right? Which sounds very sad, but it really wasn't sad at all, I promise you. Um, <laughs> so these kinds of approaches, um, both the way that we thought about parents and the way that we're thinking about trying to bring these cultural values into classroom, I keep saying the word culture and values. Um, and thank you for being patient with me and not asking me what I meant by that. <laughs> um, and some of it is that we're working on it right now, right? Uh, typically when people talk about culture, they talk about culture as kind of a genius of humans, like this is cultured, right? There's music and art and dance. Um, most of the time, I think, when we talk about culture, we're often referring to the symbols um, and embedded traditions human use to find meaning in their lives, meaning like their religious practices, right? Or maybe the foods of their family. These very kind of symbolic meanings say, I am from this specific culture, or it's almost an ethnicity. Um, or other times, and this is the way that we'd like to, we're thinking about culture, it's a way that we organize and make sense of our lived experiences. So this is the everyday interactions that we have and how they influence how we see the world around us. So those influences can be anything from the rituals in our family to gossip that we hear, memes, social networks that we're a part of, our educational experience. But what I think is important is we all have these different cultural influences is the strategies that we end up using based off of those influences in dealing with the world in an everyday way. And that's what values are. They're the resulting strategies for how we deal with the world and how it guides our actions. So cultural values end up influencing what we find is interesting, authentic, personally meaningful, culturally relevant and appropriate. And these are kind of the buzzwords that you will find in the learning sciences for motivating people to learn. You have to use interest-driven learning or authentic learning or personally meaningful learning. Yet those terms aren't really uh, looked at in terms of this cultural context. And if you bring them all together, it really is about the cultural values that are, are brought, all of them fit underneath that umbrella, so to speak. So by calling this kind of approach towards learning as value-driven learning, um, we say that values are the ways that we act upon these cultural influences, and we often do this without thinking. Um, so values are as an automated action. Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example of this. And I was thinking about, um, so if we value being environmentally conscious, right? So I can say that that's a value of mine. I've actually even thought about it. The way that I act in the world on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't sit there and say, I should throw you this away. How do I value? to throw this away right now. I've created a strategy that every time I go to throw something away, I think about whether it goes in recycling or trash, right? I don't think about my deeper values that go on in this. It becomes an automated process that we go through. These are strategies for dealing with the world, not necessarily this long reflective process. So what are the values, this, the everyday practices of reacting to the world that drive students to learn? And I think these are the questions that we need to ask. It's not about the big interest. It's not about um, the, the big thing, but some of it's about the little thing, like why I kept quiet to my parents that I was studying computer science, right? 
Um, and then what are the values that drive students away from learning? So often when we look at motivation, we just think about what's going to get people interested in learning. We don't think about the things that are blocking that learning from happening. And that's when things are in conflict with the students' values. So we've been using value-driven learning as a lens on understanding how strategies are used to navigate cultural experiences and influence learning. But we've also been using it as a lens to help us with design of learning technologies and environments that are more equitable. So I just want to give a quick shout out to my students. All the work with Latino parents is really led by Metasol. Um, Kayla, who's now at NYU, and Zane, who should be writing his dissertation but is teaching at Barry College instead, is <laughs> they both did all the work in terms of developing curriculum around the maker-based work that we're doing. Um, I also have students that are studying things from such a wide range as WeChat, as emerging infrastructure, um, disease literacy for chronically ill children with games. And there's no good pictures for their work, so I just put them all on one slide. <laughs> so Amber <coughs> Solomon is a computer is interested in computer science, education, and spatial reasoning, particularly in how culture um, shapes the metaphors that we use in spatial reasoning, which suggests that the way that we're teaching computer science often through these spatial reasoning concepts is tied up in the culture of the person who's teaching it which can be problematic because then we're just reinforcing the same people learning computer science, same types of people learning computer science. Um, Chelsea's just started and she's looking at student responses to sensor data in the classroom. And finally, Vanessa's looking at wearable health technology for African American women. So as you can see, we have this wide range of projects, but all of them do unite under this idea of what is culture and how does culture shape our use of technology. So that is everything I have, and thank you so much for your time. I'm open to questions. The results were horrible. Um, as far as the search queries, it surprised me that yeah. they were as bad as they were. Yeah. Um, during our lunch, we kind of talked about like conspiracy culture a little bit, you know, yeah. like cultures uh, that people might adopt that further propagate uh, negative sentiments they have or just misconceptions. Um, I, I guess like how do you how do you feel research should one like not just find out what's going on but really try to make like it, like what is what are researchers' roles to make those the necessary changes in society uh, to, to help the cultures that you know propagate like negative memes, right? Um, they might be valuable to, to certain people, but they might be incredibly uh, uh, like racist or uh, misogynistic, right? Uh, but those are representative of a group's culture, mm -hmm. but it, it's a culture that's negatively impacting other people or continuing to propagate uh, systematic issues. Mm -hmm. So. How does research want to address that, or like I guess what are regulatory practices that should be then kind of taken up either by government or by technology companies to kind of address that? Yeah, I think that um, it's a difficult thing to address because um, what we see when I talk sometimes to researchers or educators that work on issues around parenting, one of the pieces of feedback I get often is that lower income parents just don't care about their kids. They aren't coming to the school functions. They obviously aren't putting the effort in. Um, and then I talk to the parents from low-income neighborhoods and they love their kids, which shouldn't be a shocker to anyone, and really care about their futures. Um, so it, it, one of the things that it has brought home for me is to be a little less judgmental about what is good culture and what is bad, right? Um, I think that I think that a lot of the artificial intelligence and machine learning that we have implemented 
um, in the world today is actually amplifying some of the more negative parts of our society. So I think it's about fixing the computation. I don't think it's about saying, I'm going to go fix the person, right? So how can we actually make that technology so it isn't amplifying anything, really, in that kind of a way, in a, in a ridiculous way? Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, it just sounded to me like you're like building more checks into the system to kind of not necessarily I may be talking like about magic. behavior, but to, <laughs> to find ways to emphasize like better aspects or better practices of it, right? So if someone has like this just incredibly deep need. Yeah, I mean, like I think that a lot of the things that are implemented, let's say with um, automated uh, systems to monitor social networks, right? Mm -hmm is they put in a set of keywords that if those come up, you have to like block it, right? And maybe breast is in there, right? But somebody might be talking about breastfeeding, and that's a totally legitimate thing for people to talk about on this site, but it excludes that too. So, and plus maybe it's okay to talk about breast. I mean, that might be perfectly fine. <laughs> um, I think that we need to be careful about saying we're gonna put in checks that are about specific things, but more about checking the technology that it's not amplifying things. And, in really any direction, right? I mean, you can build technology with your own values embedded in it to try and make things happen. I think you need to do that very conscious that you're doing it. I, I don't think it's wrong. Almost all of my learning interventions that I make are about like, I think it's important for people to learn this thing. But I also think it's important for them to learn it within their own context or within their own, you know, yeah, within their own context. Um, particularly, I, I'm really interested in the, the music uh, management type game. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're trying to, uh, or what's embedded in the game, and like the mechanics that you're using to get across the concept? Sure. So it's not a game about learning. Sure. That's like, and it's actually much easier to make a fun game that's about assessment than about learning. That was one thing that we found out, right? because um, the kids really like it. They think it's super fun. So it's a music management game. You are running a production studio. You have like $250,000 to start with. You can sign artists, but each artist has to get paid a monthly amount. Um, and then you can record songs by each one of those artists and release them to different boroughs amongst our fictional city or empire, right? Um, we're hoping that what this will do is help us measure if students are going in to look at the data, like the trends is what it's called, actually, not data, about what's most popular in that borough in terms of genre, mood, or topic of song. Right? And that will shape the decisions that they make in terms of what they're recording and releasing in specific boroughs. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, well, we are looking at um, game analytics and finding out like one of the things that we saw, at least from our observations, is that when students suddenly start losing money, then they start looking at trends to figure out how they can keep themselves from losing money, right? So that means that they're able to use those trends and if they look at them and then their money increases, it means they're using them successfully, which means they understand the concepts. So obviously this isn't, we can't take the 20 kids who have used this game so far and come up with anything. We need hundreds of users before we can say these data analytics from the game are any good. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I find it really interesting that you made the distinction between it not being <coughs> like a game meant for learning, but we are still talking about having them or seeing if they are using <coughs> tools embedded in the game to kind of explore uh, uh, something that you know, so they're hoping they might So if a student really can't read those graphs, they can't use it to inform their decision. And that is what we're trying to, in part, trying to find out. If a student can't understand um, that getting more data is better, like collecting more data is better, then they're only gonna have a very limited amount of information, so they won't do as well in the game. Yeah. So those are the kind of measures that we're looking at. We really kept trying to make it, because all of us are learning scientists, we kept trying to make it about learning like through the design process and having to check ourselves constantly. Like, wait, we don't care if they learn anything having to say that over and over again so uh, do you have a question I did have a question um, it was more aligned with the search engine optimization of sure. um, educational websites did, mm -hmm. um, did you just search and did you just look on the pages of the website so you could contact the web developers or I was just curious 
Yeah. We did contact several of them, um, and none of them gave us access. Um, is yeah. there any, are there any conversations in, I guess, the science and technology communication literature or field about search engine optimization and making information more readily available to uh, more users? So there's, I am not an expert on search engine optimization, and if I was, I would hire myself a, as a consultant for a lot more money than I make right now. Um, so we took just basics of search engine optimization and looked at the sites if they were covering even the basics, and they're not. They don't even have meta tags or titles on a lot of their pages, and if they do, the titles don't even mention the word computing or learning, right? So it ju it's not, it wouldn't be very hard, you don't have to be very good at it to make these better. Um, there was one site that appeared multiple times through the searches called Tinker. It's a for-profit CS education site, and it occurred multiple times. It had really pretty good search engine optimization. So it can be done, and it, it's not difficult to do. Um, we talked to Scratch about this for the first time in 2012, and I asked them if they implement this, can I test it after they implement it and see what happens. They've never done anything. I talked to them about it again two years ago. They've still never done anything. I, I'm sorry, I'm totally dissing on Scratch. I think it's an amazing <laughs> tool, right, for learning. But it's just like such a little thing, and access is so important, right? In the back? Yeah. So uh, I was at Georgia Tech in 2012. Uh -huh. When you, I think it was 2012, when you uh, talked about the saving spaces. Yeah. spoken to me as someone who came from a low income background in general. So that that so that thought that that was a, a low income or maybe a blue collar background trend is, is to want to save space to pre pretend that the thing you're doing that might be teaching you something or might be at a percept perceptibly higher socioeconomic status. Yeah. That's the thing I'm going to not emphasize but I'm going to tell them all about how I'm really doing, you know, play what that meant when I was in, in teaching. Um, and I, I didn't find that there was much I could do as a teacher um, to m mitigate much of that. But uh, I did find that if I made sure I used free tools, mm -hmm. that they were more likely to end up going home and using those tools at home. Um, and I wondered much of an emphasis or how much you looked at, uh, you know, an equitable access of tools or emphasizing free tool use um, in research towards developing good science education or et cetera when communicating with educators about what to implement. Because a lot of the, like, districts, they like to hire some group to come in and, and sell a product instead of emphasizing free tool use. Yeah. Um, there's one organization that does a really good job with this called Power My Learning. Um, it used to be called Computers for Use, so CFY it sometimes goes by. But they use the, uh, that's, um, they come into schools, CFY goes into schools, a middle school, and they provide a free computer for all sixth graders, and these are all refurbished computers. And then they give them training on how to access these free tools through this portal called Power My Learning, right? And I think that's a great idea of how we can do this kind of communication. Um, they're actually a national organization, but even at the scale that they're at, they're only hitting a minuscule number of schools every year, right? Um, it's pretty difficult to communicate with parents about these free access tools, um, and they're not easy to find as that search engine optimization paper says. Um, and surprisingly, the developers aren't that interested in putting the time in to change that, which I'm not quite sure why that is, but yeah. And I don't one know more, I, and then Sure, more and there's a book by Herbert Cole who you should read about doing classroom work about students who don't want to learn, which I think is really fascinating. It's a great read. Go ahead. Thank you for showing all this 
work. Um, I was particularly fascinated by the glitch sure. um, program you, you first you started talking with. And as someone who is a student of critical race theory, um, I found so many resonances there. Um, there's such a strong critical social critique that that could be framed in, in the sense of, you know, imagine suddenly having social <laughs> institutional support, feeling enfranchised, feeling like your cultural capital is valuable, feeling that someone believes in you, right, just changes things for you. Yeah. I understand that, you know, you may not be in that space, but I'm wondering if you can comment kind of bigger to any kind of critical cultural theory that, or what, what the critical intervention there might be in your eyes. Well, I was certainly reading some uh, critical race theory at the time that this intervention was happening, and that was framing a lot of the arguments and things that I looked at. Um, and certainly, I so I was looking at actually the way that I framed a lot of this was around masculinities, um, around African American male masculinity, and idealized um, geek masculinity is what I called it, um, and this idea that. Uh, these two different types of masculinities were producing different kinds of you know, engagement with technology. Um, so I think some of the stuff I was reading about critical race theory was probably most important for me because I was a person when I first started this work who had never really talked about race out loud a whole lot. Right? And so the stages that one might go through when they're looking at critical race theory, I watched myself go through those things. Right, it was. It was, um, I learned more about my own race through that dissertation than I would have ever expected. So, I don't think that answers your question, but it's part of it. Well, thanks so much. It was great. You have a snack downstairs.